family owned and operated business. Right. How many employees do you have? I have five now, uh, down from my peak of 14 back in the olden days. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> but there's been such a revolution in our business that uh, uh, n nationwide that it's. Uh, oh, yeah, with all the digital. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, the online stuff has hit us pretty hard. And with all the digital stuff, they, a lot of people have brought their, their capacity in-house. Uh -huh. <coughs> yeah. okay. So um, you're not originally from Citrus Heights, right? No, I was born and raised in Oregon and okay. came here from the Bay Area. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your, your family and your background. I'm a preacher's kid. <laughs> no, I, I was born in Klamath Falls, Oregon, and uh, Klamath Falls, of course, is only 30 miles from Tule Lake, California, which is one of the internment camps for the Japanese, so as a small child, I remembered a great deal of conversation about the, the Japanese internment camp there, and... Uh, Did you get to see it? Or? Well, I've subsequently toured it as an adult, but... Uh, my grandparents on my father's side were convinced that all the new refrigerators and stoves that they couldn't buy during the war were going to the internment camp, which simply wasn't the case, but it was one of those urban legends that, that occurred before the term urban legend was invented. <laughs> so then what brought you to Citrus Heights? Well, I uh, went, uh, moved to Berkeley after I got out of the Army and then uh, I came to Sacramento as the business, church business administrator at Fremont Presbyterian Church, that, that large church down by the Sac State campus. I was there for seven years and then took a similar position in the Bay Area, and that was not a, a, a good fit, <laughs> shall we say. So I decided to try to open my own business, and we looked at about 40 or so different businesses and decided printing was a good one. And, we bought a franchise in Sacramento, or Citrus Heights was open, so we moved back here in, in 1977. We've been here from 69 to 76 in Sacramento, and then we were gone for a year. So. Okay. So you first moved to Citrus Heights in 1977? Right. Oh, was it any different back oh, then? Oh, yes. What was, what was it like? Well, uh, th uh, we had Montgomery Ward where Lowe's is now, and there was a brick Macy's store where uh, Target is now, and there, and there was Liberty House where Macy's Women's is, and there was Wine Stocks where uh, the Macy's Men's is. Uh, m many of the other developments were, were just grass fields at that time. And so it's, there's been a number of changes. Now how did you get involved in the incorporation effort? <clears throat> I became active in the Chamber of Commerce shortly after we founded our business in 1977 and uh, I was moving up through the chairs and I was chairman for a couple of years of an organization called Trico which was a tri-county effort to, to build a a beltway from the south end of Highway 65 in Roseville down along Grant Line Road and across to connect to, to Highway 99 and Interstate 5. Uh, we had uh, 30 people participating in that, which were mostly the development directors and, and planners from the other counties. And uh, we raised a bunch of money and SACOG did a, a tentative route study and drew lines on map and everybody was in favor of the Beltway until they saw where the lines were on the map and uh, uh, then it, uh, we got a lot of opposition from the city of Folsom and so that sort of went away but in the meantime uh, the incorporation effort had started and so Rich Wagner was the original president of uh, the incorporation effort and he w was also a, a president of the Chamber of Commerce. So I became involved in the Citrus Heights Incorporation effort after the Trico effort folded and uh, Rich wanted to step down so I 
came on as president. But why did you get involved? Why, why did you want Citrus Heights to be a city? Uh, we were a cash cow for the rest of the county, and we were also getting uh, dumped on as far as the, the less attractive services. Uh, one statistic that is, stands out in my mind is that uh, nobody wants childcare in their neighborhood uh, because they don't like, on the cul-de-sacs, they don't like the, the traffic of having children dropped off and picked up and that kind of thing. But at the time we started the incorporation efforts on San Juan Avenue between Madison and Greenback, there were 23 childcare facilities. So they were willing to have them close by, you know, the residents of Carmichael and Fair Oaks, but they weren't willing to have them in their neighborhoods. And then when cell towers came along, that w was the same kind of thing. They, they wanted the service, but not the ugly structures that went with it. Now, of course, cell, cell phone use is ubiquitous. When it first came along, <laughs> nobody in the world thought it would be anything other than mobile phones in the car, and so the tower should be along the highways. Well, now, no, a lot of people don't even have landlines <laughs> anymore. <laughs> which, so who was it that was allowing all these things to happen? The Board of Supervisors. Uh, and uh, we were getting very, very poor police protection. At one point, uh, the, when the sheriffs w were under budget constraints, uh, in the middle of the night, on some weeknights, we had 0.9 of one officer covering our area. In other words, we had less than one patrol officer that could cover Citrus Heights. So if a major incident occurred, they had to travel a, gr a great di distance if they were even available to, to respond to calls. And of course, we weren't getting any uh, uh, support in terms of, of crime prevention or anything like that. Were there any other things like that? that, that well, the cash cow thing, uh, is certainly uh, the, the studies showed that we were generating through sales tax and other revenues more money than we were receiving in goods and services. I I used to joke about when I was leading the incorporation effort at that time we had one seventh of the population of the un unincorporated area of the county and I used to joke about which floor of the seven floors of the county administration building were we going to get because if we had one-seventh the population we should get one-seventh of the assets and <laughs> of course that was uh, semi-facetious but uh, just before she retired Roberta McClashen the retiring supervisor said we'd be glad to give you that building now it's in such disrepair that you could have it. <laughs> okay. So now uh, what, what prompted the formation of CHIP? Or tell me, first tell me what, uh, what CHIP is and how it got started. CHIP is the Citrus Heights Incorporation Project, and it was formed by business people, uh, primarily in the Chamber of Commerce, who saw the need for us to be able to control our own destiny and to make our own decisions in Citrus Heights. So it was, uh, it came out of the, out of the Chamber, and it had uh, fairly broad community support. And then um, I assume that the, the members probably felt the same as you about the disproportionate. Yes, there were, uh, there were a lot of, uh, of reasons for wanting to incorporate and various people had various, had their own ideas about what was important. Uh, a new city can take over the uh, park service and the fire service uh, and those kinds of uh, services, but uh, we didn't ever feel that, th that we were poorly served by those agencies, so we never from the very beginning wanted to take over the uh, uh, park or fire services. We did want to take over the police services. Okay. Now in the uh, beginning of 85, LAFCO undertook a, a feasibility study, was it on co incorporation? Well, LAFCO is the organization that governs uh, 
mergers and boundary changes and formations uh, of entities like cities. And uh, when the original incorporation effort started, the first step is, is there any kind of a, a reasonable pr uh, possibility of this new entity being financially sound? And LAFCO's original study was a very, very broad stroke uh, study uh, looking at, if you, if you will, micro, macro numbers, and they came with the idea that Citrus Heights would be a, a financially viable. What prompted them to do this feasibility study? LAFCO did the feasibility study because uh, of a request from the from CHIP, from the Citrus Sites Incorporation Project, we were at a point where we needed to take the next step, and the next step is to contact LAFCO. And we worked with LAFCO, and the executive director at that time named John O'Farrell was very supportive and, and uh, very, very helpful as we worked our way through the process because we were all uh, amateurs and didn't, you know, didn't know all the steps, but he was very, thorough in not necessarily advocating for us, but being sure that we knew what steps we had to take in order to, to uh, meet the criteria that's in the state law. <coughs> now you have, um, do you want a drink or? No, it's fine. Okay. So you, hit, you get LAFCO's blessing and what, what happened then? LAFCO declared that we were uh, financially feasible based on their analysis. So uh, at that point, they allowed us to go ahead and file for uh, circulating a petition. And we also had to hire uh, a proper consultant uh, to do a more detailed financial feasibility study. And that was Ralph Anderson, which they, they came up with the same conclusion uh, that LAFCO had that we, yes, indeed, were financially feasible. The petitions are like any other petition for a ballot initiative, uh, whether it's statewide or local, you have to collect a, a certain percentage of signatures based on the registered voters that, that voted in the last election. So we collected uh, 12,000 signatures, which was, I think, about 3,000 more than we needed in order to qualify the, for the ballot. And qualifying the election initiative was like qualifying any of the others that we are bombarded with at <laughs> nearly every election. So what was that like, collecting the signatures? Was it easy, hard? Collecting signatures was very much a grassroots effort. Many, many uh, signature collection efforts are based on pay or, or recruit paid uh, uh, signature gatherers. We did not. We were all volunteer and we were on, you know, the typical ironing board in front of the supermarket and circulating the petition around the neighborhood and, and doing that kind of thing. We didn't pay anybody to, to uh, get signatures for us. Okay. And then at some point the chamber formally endorsed incorporation? Yes. They, uh, I would have to refer to my notes to know what exactly the, the, the year, but they, the chamber formally, the Citrus Heights Chamber of Commerce formally under, uh, endorsed the, the Citrus Heights incorporation effort and were an integral part and an essential part from that time forward. Okay. I was just going to ask why was it important to get their endorsement? Well, they rep the chamber's endorsement was important because uh, it, at that time, it represented about 300 of the businesses in Citrus Heights, many of which were were locally owned, you know, mom and pop kind of businesses. Uh, and uh, the businesses, by and large, were uh, supportive of the incorporation effort. Okay. One of the funny things was that <clears throat> I, when I made speeches about incorporation and I was always invited to rotary clubs and other chambers and that kind of thing the uh, I said well you driving north on sunrise you could always tell where Roseville started because they had decorative banners on the poles and Mike Oliver 
uh, our first interim city manager had some highway money that he had to use up or lose and that's when the new purple street signs came up and he also put decorative banners on the poles and it was like six months after we were incorporated here were these decorative banners on the poles. I was so surprised because I had sort of said that facetiously, when, you know, that you could tell the boundary. Because <clears throat> well, yeah, now you can tell when you come into Citrus Heights. Right. <laughs> okay, so you've got LAFCO is saying this is good to go and you've got the petition signatures then what happened? Well, uh, Prop 13 threw everything in, uh, uh, into turmoil and many years before the county supervisors had, had supported a, a, a very feeble effort at incorporation and had even extended the deadline for collecting signatures. But after Prop 13, the, the county became uh, very protective of the revenue and so the county supervisors were opposed to incorporation and for some reason that I have never understood the Deputy Sheriff's Association also came in at a very high profile opposition. And I can elaborate on that if you want. But, uh. okay. Well um, I think what was the first thing that they did that kind of you sensed that there was a bump in the road? Well, we had hearings before LAFCO uh, about the feasibility and what the boundaries would be and, and a lot of the technical details about uh, how the city would be organized and these hearings went on uh, over a, a number of months and it was interesting because Toby Johnson was this one of the two county uh, representatives on LAFCO. LAFCO is a seven person uh, entity and so Toby Johnson was the uh, representative to LAFCO, one of the two representatives from LAFCO for the Board of Supervisors and Grantland Johnson was the alternate. Toby was in support of incorporation Grantland and the majority of the board were opposed so during a LAFCO hearing if we were item five on the agenda Toby Johnson would sit in the chair for items one through four he had to get up and excuse himself and Grantland would sit down for item five which would be uh, our incorporation effort and then he would vote no and then when we were done with our agenda item he would get up and leave and Toby would come back and, and uh, vote, uh, be the representative for the balance of the meeting. Uh, that was the kind of thing that was going on. Uh, How could they do that? Uh, the board can designate who their representatives are on uh, the multiple entities that, that, that cities and counties have seats on and they passed a resolution that said that, that, that I don't know whether, what the wording was, whether they disqualified Toby or, or just instructed him to vacate his seat at that time. Uh, that was kind of a message that Board of Supervisors were not in favor of incorporation? Oh, we knew it from the very beginning and uh, we knew that they were opposed from, from day one uh, on incorporation. Uh, we did get LAFCO's approval. Most of the time it was a four to three vote uh, and we, it came to the point where the Board of Supervisors had to set an election date and we were shooting for November of 1986 and the action of setting an election date after it's sent to the Board of Supervisors from LAFCO is what is called a ministerial action. That is that they don't have a, uh, the right to decline to do it. The law says you will do this if it's referred to you from LAFCO. Well, the Board of Supervisors refused to set the election date and so at that point uh, I as an individual uh, sued the county uh, to, with uh, the lawsuit, I don't remember the technical term, I could look it up, but the, the lawsuit stated that or, or was to force, or to, let me restate that, the lawsuit was asking the court to direct the county to set 
the election date. And at that point, the county uh, sued back. And so the, the original lawsuit was folded into the larger lawsuit. And the... And what did the county sue for? What did they counter sue for? They, they uh, sued on the basis that um, there were three points. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll start the question. So, um, so now the county's refusing to set a ballot date. You sue the county, and then the county sues, countersues. What? The county countersued us for uh, uh, several reasons. One had to do with the requirement to do an environmental impact report. The county's own environmental department had ruled that we did not have to do an environmental impact report or an EIR because the state law says that a mere change of political boundaries does not in and of itself require an EIR. The county felt that in order for us to do an environmental impact report, it would break us financially, which uh, was, was a valid uh, assumption because the EIR ended up costing uh, in excess of $130,000, and that was money that we did not have. The, the county also sued on the basis of one person, one vote. They felt that under Prop 13, the law says that there can be no tax increase unless the, the people vote on it. And allowing us to vote for incorporation would be a de facto increase uh, in taxes on the rest of the county because we would be extracting the, that money from the county coffers. And so they felt that the entire county should be able to vote on who the representative, first of all, whether we should incorporate and then who the city council people would be. And also on the ballot is what is the name of the new city. And so they felt like people in Laguna and Elk Grove and, and Galt should be able to vote on whether or not we became a city based on that, that uh, uh, Prop 13 uh, ruling. It sounds like the county really liked the fact that Citrus Sites was supporting the rest of the county. <laughs> the, they, they had the, a good thing and they didn't want to lose it. The county did not want to lose our revenue. Uh, we also were, at that point, uh, arguing about who was going to pay whose attorney's fees. I mentioned that the Deputy Sheriff's Association was uh, vehemently opposed to the incorporation, and so they hired their own attorney and formed an organization called Sacramentans to Save Our Services, which was a, uh, an effort to, to convince the Board of Supervisors and the media th that if we incorporated all of these uh, community services that the Board of Supervisors supported in their budget, w that support would go away and it could have been for KVIE or for aid for uh, uh, physically challenged people. There was a wide range of people that they put on this list. So the world as we know it was going to come to an end if Citrus Heights incorporates? Pretty much, <laughs> yes. And then there was a, a technical issue about the minutes of, of one of the meetings that was also included in the lawsuit. So uh, that lawsuit didn't come to trial for well over a year. And as was, became our experience, the period between uh, court hearings were, were very difficult for us because uh, a lot of people gave up on, on incorporation because it was in the hands of the courts and we weren't going to hear it for another 14 or 18 months. And so we, uh, our group became very attenuated during the uh, time that we were uh, going through the court process. Yeah, this is now starting to become a very protracted endeavor. At one point, uh, I think it was 67 cities 
filed Friends of the Court briefs when the issue finally went to the California State Supreme Court, and all those briefs were in favor of Citrus Heights. So you got some aid from outside or some support from other cities? The issue of Citrus Heights Incorporation was a grave concern to the League of California Cities simply because it was likely to set precedent for other incorporations. The question came up a few minutes ago about the difference between counties and cities. Uh, counties are established in the state constitution and they provide certain services like jails and, and health and welfare and uh, roads and those kinds of things. Counties are not set up to provide urban services like a city does and most counties uh, throughout the state encouraged incorporations because they weren't set up to, to provide the kind of urban services that a city does. Uh, 